Well, thank you for being here, and I have the pleasure uh, to welcome you to this session of the Urban Metabolism uh, Seminar as part of the Cephizus Weekly uh, Seminar Series. Um, this, for this session, uh, we will be talking about an issue that we are facing uh, in our work at the Urban Metabolism Lab. And this issue is uh, how uh, conceptual analysis can inform decision making on model selection. And we will tackle this issue through the lenses of uh, how modeling the urban metabolism uh, can be our modeling uh, the urban metabolism uh, can be furthered by uh, paying attention to uh, the concept of agency both from a theoretical perspective and from a modeling um, perspective. As for the presentation, my colleague Ezan is going to uh, present his work uh, besides on you know, the modeling side of uh, uh, our research and then I will jump in uh, um, with uh, uh, some questions more than answers uh, regarding how uh, this work on the characterization of models uh, and the construction of a model decision tree uh, for urban metabolism studies can be connected with uh, uh, um, um, a more theoretical endeavor uh, aiming to clarify, to, to illuminate how the concept of agency is defined and deployed in urban metabolism studies. So, hasn't? Yeah, Nicole, uh, no, it's okay. Nicole already said the two sentences about you know, the kickoff support. This is exactly what <laughs> Sorry, it's exactly to be Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I abused my power. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Good. Very timely today, Belgium. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ehsan Ahmadiyan. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Urban Metabolism Lab. Welcome you all. I'm happy to have you here today. Uh, I'm contributing to the ACE Nexus project it, together with my colleague Elisabeth uh, Nicola and also a pro promoter Daniela. Uh, and uh, I'm in charge of the uh, work package 2, which focuses on the modeling aspect in urban metabolism studies. So uh, the aim has been that to uh, provide a, a characterization of the model used in the urban, urban metabolism studies and then in the next step to build a model decision tree. So uh, to have it a bit more, uh, I mean, easier to digest, uh, let's say uh, urban metabolism considered as, as a, like a center of gravity and then uh, we consider the studies who are within at least one of these three discipl disciplines industrial ecology, urban ecology, and uh, social ecology. Then the, we extracted the models that used in those studies. I mean, these are like, it's, they are, we, we are already identified about 20 model types. And then the third, the third, let's say, side of this center would be the concept of agency. And uh, we are going to discover if they use the concept of agency and if so, how. Um, this is the methodolo methodological steps that we took from the beginning until now. We started with the initial search string that we came up, and we came up with 1858 studies and then by further screening the title and abstracts we came to 692 studies. Then we identified models from, from those studies, again, the number reduced to 447 that used a model at least in their studies. And then we assigned disciplines to each of the studies. Uh, and then we develop a selection criteria to choose the top 50% of the uh, studies and came up with 189. And the selection criteria could be things like uh, citation per year or like uh, having at least a geographical location specified assigned to the study like a case study and the diversity of geographical location was important as well because we wanted to make sure that the models applies in different places around the world 
Uh, and at the end, the last step was to, to identify if they used agency somehow in their study or not. Therefore, we realized at the end that only 60 studies already dealing with the, um, the concept of agency. Okay, so from almost 2000 to 60 studies. Uh, okay, so, so to, far, to further dis discover the, I mean, after having this, these studies, we started uh, discovering our, in, the information that we needed by posing three questions. Uh, who are the agents in, in those studies, which means that the terms that used to describe, describe agents. The second question was that, what do they do? So how they inf the, the agent influenced the system? And uh, the third question, how were they modeled in the study? Uh, to answer this question, we categorized them into four different levels of engagement, depends on the depth of uh, impact of agent into the study. So level one, which is the lowest level of engagement, is the, when the agent's behavior or activity impacted the data for, used for the study. For example, like when there is a, like an energy flow analysis or material flow analysis, something, uh, imagine one of those models, and if you use the, the energy consumption data of the building, they, the, the, they only use those data, but the data already affected by behavior of the residents. So that's the lowest level of engagement. Level two, when the agent attended, agents attended an uh, interview or workshop or something like this, but for example, imagine the stakeholders in construction or in, in uh, energy sector attend the conference or interview and the, the obtained data was used as additional material to complement the result of modeling. And level three, which is more or less similar, but at the end, the obtained data was used in modeling to upgrade the modeling outcome, I mean, embedded inside the modeling. And the last and most important level is level four, when agents are directly embedded in the model, which is actually the definition of agent-based modeling. Um, so, as a result of this study, uh, the first question answered in this way. So, who are the agents? The term that we have discovered are like uh, the, the, the terms that you can see here. Uh, and the, uh, I wrote the number of occurrence of those terms in the studies. Actor as the highest occurrence with uh, 23 times, sector 17 times, stakeholder 10 times, and then they get lower and lower. Industry, organizational, non human agent, human agent, uh, transportation agents, and so on. But I have to mention that some of these terms are, we, we, we define them as umbrella term for the, the, the agents that more or less has a similar, um, let's say, impact or, or, or concept in, in the modeling. For example, resource user groups uh, talks about uh, either it could be people, residents, uh, citizens, these kind of keywords, you know. Um, yeah. And, and then, uh, just, uh, okay, to answer the second question, what do they do? Uh, for, for that, I expanded one of the, one of the um, terms for agent, which is actor. So, so, so this is on, only the first one. So because, because they, they used either alone or in combination with other terms in a phrase. So for actor, we have seven times occurrence of metabolic actors one times economic actor, two times social actor, and urban act actors, policy actors, utility actors, and so, so on. Um, and in, in the right hand side, in the right side, right column, uh, they, uh, what they do is written there. So, so they, they're how they influence the system. For example, metabolic actors are defined as socioeconomic actors that consume or generate energy and or material or, for example, um, urban actors are institution, institutions influencing urban forest ecosystems like city government, neighborhood associations, green businesses, and so on. And all the, the other definitions that can help us at the end for building the model decision tree in a uh, more proper way. Um, then the third question, 
how were they modeled? So let's see what was the result. Uh, the, the, from the 60 uh, identified papers, eight studies engaged with agents at level one, only four studies at level two, 12 studies at level three, and 36 studies engaged with agents at level four. Uh, this shows uh, statistically the relationship between num number of studies, which means that the, the, the models itself and the level of engagements. So you can see here, for example, the first model is uh, energy uh, network analysis. Uh, it's, it, it, it's all engaged uh, with agent at level four. But we have like material flow analysis that is very peculiar because it can be engaged with agents in all four level, levels of engagement, which shows the flexibility of, of this model. So to, from these things, we can uh, get impression at the end uh, how to build the decision system. And other ones, as you can see, depending on the, uh, there are our color codes. Uh, another uh, relationship which was interesting for us was the relationship of level of engagement and the term used to define agent. So here we can see that, for example, the, the terms such as sector, industry, residential, environment, they en were engaged with uh, models only at level four, but we have a stakeholder and household that they were engaged with models in all different levels of engagement. Uh, then an another interesting relationship was models and, and the terms used use as agents. Uh, and you can see here again, we have material flow analysis, life cycle assessment, and, and energy network analysis as a, the ones with the highest diversity of terms used in their studies. And the relationship between models and the disciplines uh, shows that most of them were within the framework of industrial ecology, 37 studies. 22 in urban ecology and only four of them in social ecology. And, and, and you can see how models are connected with disciplines. Uh, just as an example, you can see material flow analysis is the only, only model that, has, that was engaged with the uh, concept of uh, agency at, at, uh, in, 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 the, in all three disciplines. So, so it has been adopted by all three disciplines. Uh, but that, that, that uh, graph is, is interesting because it can connect three different variables instead of two, unlike the previous ones. And it shows the occurrence of, of uh, the terms in different levels of engagement, four, three, two, one, and in different disciplines, depending on the color, depending on the, on the color. So you can see that here, actor and sector with these very big, biggest circles, uh, occurred like 16 and 40 times at level 4 in industrial ecology disciplines. Uh, I, I can just mention stakeholder because this, this is the only term that, uh, that has been used uh, in all three disciplines and at all four levels of engagement. Uh, okay, then, then we came up with this table, which is, let's say, the outcome of this first stage of this study, model characterization. So we call it model, uh, model characterization table, and we define three different, different um, indicators uh, for illustrations. We have boundary spanning, which means that how many disciplines adopted that model. We have inclusiveness, which means that how many terms how many terms that define agents has been adopted by the models. And finally, flexibility that shows that the agent, uh, in, in how many level of engagement an agent has been used in the model. So, uh, and the first column for, sure, of course, uh, showing the, um, the models. Mm, based on the information from this table, uh, I developed a Radar chart to show the comprehensiveness. So we we, we consider that you know that the uh, let's say the accumulative impact of all those indi indicators 
in one indicator, which is comprehensiveness. It shows the comprehensiveness of, of the models on the radar chart. So we have like, like a triangle, each of the indicators in, in, on one, one side of the triangle. And you can see that the, 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 the biggest triangle is, is the blue one, which is material flow analysis, and it, this is, which is the most comprehensive model. So the higher is the surface area of the triangle, the higher is the comprehensiveness of the model. Then, then we have life cycle assessment, and uh, the, 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 the lowest comprehensive models are water balance, uh, carbon accounting, and energy flow analysis, with the, the smallest triangles in the, in the middle. Uh, then, okay, there is another aspect, another, uh, let's say, uh, type of analysis to understand if the models are special or and or temporal dynamics or, or not. And uh, for that, uh, we just define in each of the studies that if this model is impacted by time or space or not. And then we provided the statistical uh, results here. Uh, for example, you can see here that energy network analysis is engaged in both uh, especially and temporal, te temporary, but more temporal uh, basically. So, so 50% of the studies were uh, temporal dynamics, while only 25% of them uh, special dynamic. Or there are some models like carbon accounting and water balance that they only uh, they, they 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 were not uh, either of them. Uh, or energy flow analysis that are only a special dynamic. So I have to but mention anyway that uh, this is based on the data we have from the literature. Of course, it's, it's a limitation of, of the studies. So, so it's based on all the literature that, that, that we found until I think October 2022. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, finally, okay, so that was, that was the, the first stage to have this cartesian model. And now uh, I'm working on the transition from characterization model to a model decision tree. So uh, to show the real connections of all those variables that I was talking about. So the model, it, it is just, uh, it's, it's under construction actually, but it's a model decision, could be a schematic of a model decision tree uh, with different layers discipline in red and then we have uh, the terms used for agent in blue level of engagement on, in yellow and also and finally models in, in green uh, it shows the con how they can be connected how discipline can be connected to term how term to level of engagement and how model uh, connect to others for, for now it shows only the connection between this first three layers and I'm working on, on how to connect these the models to them, which is the most important step. So uh, this is, this is a, a bit uh, the, a challenging uh, job task for at this stage uh, because then we uh, we have to uh, I'm going to develop an algorithm and we are going to uh, propose this model decision tree as a kind of like a model decision tool with the interface for the users, like a researchers or whoever want to work on modeling aspect in urban metabolism uh, area. So, so they have like, uh, they have interface, they have all the options with the uh, disciplines, what are the options for uh, the agent, what are the options for the level. It's like uh, they could decide based on what they want. If they want, they, they, if they are working, for example, in uh, industrial ecology, then the, the, the tool disregards the, disregards the other two disciplines and goes for the, to, for the relationship in only industrial ecology. And then more degree of uh, limitation can, can be applied by the, by the user. So uh, yeah, so now it's the current work that is being done so far. And uh, of course we are happy to have any idea, question and critical discussion. Thank you very much. Many, so many <laughs> So thank you, Amazon. And, and we can transition to the more uh, work in progress part uh, of the presentation. 
uh, which will deal uh, with the problem of uh, connecting conceptual analysis with uh, the kind of model characterization that Eason just uh, presented. And this problem consists of two issues, at least two issues. The first issue, how to connect a characterization of agency that is uh, uh, drawn from a corpus of uh, uh, research articles that we have selected and which deal with uh, theoretical and conceptual questions uh, associated with uh, urban metabolism. So how to connect this characterization of agency with uh, an agent-centered characterization of uh, urban metabolism models. And the second issue is uh, how to enrich this uh, same characterization uh, of agency uh, drawn from uh, a corpus that we analyzed using computational uh, uh, tools uh, by grounding it into a theoretical background constituted by um, uh, systems ecology, in particular the Odum School, and uh, Niklas Luhmann's theory of social systems, which constitute uh, um, two, in two uh, sources of inspiration for uh, systems uh, approaches to the urban metabolism, uh, uh, in particular uh, uh, works done in the field of uh, uh, urban ecology, industrial ecology and social ecology, as it was discussed in the previous uh, uh, session of this uh, uh, seminar. So is this uh, uh, diagram uh, represents uh, uh, the methodology that uh, we are applying to uh, tackle those two issues. Uh, so the, uh, for the to start uh, for the start for, for the start, I will uh, uh, focus on the upper side of the diagram, which uh, uh, basically uh, depicts the, the the work we have done on uh, uh, a corpus of uh, selected research articles dealing with the urban metabolism, uh, which we presented in uh, the second uh, se the second session of this uh, seminar and which uh, um, is, uh, would be, constitutes uh, the, the content of an article, research article uh, that is in the process of publication. Basically, this, uh, in, uh, in this uh, work, we uh, used a, a minimal uh, definition of agency uh, as, uh, uh, as, the as the backbone for uh, uh, a conceptual framework that we built on uh, the results of uh, our computational analysis using three key questions uh, drawn from uh, uh, how the, the concept of urban metabolism has been developed in uh, another field, the field uh, of urban political ecology. Uh, which uh, has uh, uh, emphasized uh, the importance of agency uh, to understand uh, the power dynamics underlying uh, metabolic exchanges between uh, cities and their environments. So uh, those three questions uh, were presented in previous uh, uh, sessions of the seminar. So I'm just going to name them to just, just, to, just a, as a callback. So first question, whose agency? Second question, what is acted upon? Third question, how well, and when do, those, uh, do the actors in question exert their agentic capacity? Based uh, on, uh, uh, we used this uh, backbone uh, to uh, we used those critical questions to interpret the results uh, of our computational analysis and identify uh, four uh, agentic uh, uh, dimensions uh, that uh, um, are uh, uh, related to the, the concept of urban metabolism. And in this pyramid, uh, uh, represent them in a hierarchical order. Uh, from uh, uh, the bottom, I, uh, which represents of the pyramid, which represents uh, an agentic dimension that is related to uh, concepts uh, that are expressed by terms uh, that are uh, farther, uh, that are distant from the uh, term urban metabolism, uh, according to uh, concurrence metrics that we use to analyze uh, the corpus. Uh, up to uh, the fourth dimension, the cybernetic agency of a social ecological systems uh, components as metabolic actors, which represents uh, the uh, dimension closer, closest uh, to the term uh, urban metabolism. Based on this pyramid, uh, we uh, outlined uh, um, a conceptual uh, 
framework for uh, uh, characterizing the concept of agency in uh, um, in our in uh, urban tourism studies through uh, the lenses of our corpus uh, by identifying uh, concepts cognate to uh, urban metabolism in the sense that they are expressed by terms that uh, are that, that belong to uh, uh, the semantic field associated with the word urban metabolism itself. And those cognitive concepts also allow to uh, connect uh, the concept of urban metabolism with the concept of agency. And this connection was established through our, to, through our interpretative uh, uh, work, guided by the, the three uh, questions I mentioned. And uh, to enrich this uh, um, uh, conceptual framework, we uh, drew from uh, uh, systems ecology and uh, uh, Luhmann's theory of social systems. Uh, for time's sake, uh, I'm going to focus only on uh, uh, the, uh, the, contribute, the, what the insights we, we drew from uh, systems ecology, in particular from the Odom School. Uh, represented by uh, Eugene P. Odom and Howard T. Odom. Basically, uh, we, uh, using a critical uh, lens, uh, we try to uh, extrapolate, extract a conceptualization of agency from a uh, major work related to the Odom School. And uh, uh, in, uh, 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 in particular, uh, we looked uh, at uh, Fundamentals of Ecology, the two, two uh, editions of Fundamentals of Ecology, a uh, major work by uh, Eugene Odum and System Ecology and Introduction by uh, Howard T. Odum and uh, based on our analysis, a uh, close reading and analysis of uh, those three texts, we identified four fundamental ecological concepts that are uh, uh, constitute the foundations for uh, extrapolating, extracting a conceptualization of agency from the Odom School of uh, um, uh, in Systems Ecology. Those four concepts are ecosystem, energy, hierarchy, and spatial, spatial and temporal scale. And based on how those four concepts are uh, defined and deployed in, the, in those three works, we identified concepts cognate to the notion of agency uh, that can be uh, brought to bear to an analysis of uh, uh, urban, uh, the, the urban metabolism. Uh, this table represents uh, uh, the way in which uh, we analyzed uh, those uh, four concepts. We used uh, once more the three, uh, three fundamental questions uh, that guided our analysis of the, of the corpus uh, we analyzed for the first paper in the project. And uh, among the uh, cognate uh, concepts we identified uh, uh, with respect to uh, each of those uh, four uh, uh, fundamental ecological concepts. Uh, we, uh, in particular, we, we focused on uh, three concepts, uh, homeostasis, information development, since uh, they are particularly relevant for uh, 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 establishing a dialogue between uh, the Odum schools in school in uh, system ecology and uh, uh, Luhmann's uh, theory of social system in order to uh, uh, ex in order to um, draw insights from uh, such a dialogue and use them to enrich our uh, uh, conceptual framework for uh, characterizing agency in uh, our metabolism studies. And uh, in particular, uh, our goal is to uh, use uh, uh, those uh, concepts extracted from uh, the Odom School in dialogue with uh, Luhmann's uh, theory of social system to uh, develop uh, narratives about agency in urban metabolism studies. And narratives, uh, as we are, as we understand, can be defined uh, this is one possible definition as a discursive account so that highlight how uh, those uh, the, the cognitive concepts I was referring to express different forms of agency with respect to urban metabolic processes and uh, 
uh, those uh, such uh, discursive accounts, uh, in particular, pro provide notably provide context, uh, situation, scenarios in which uh, uh, those uh, uh, the forms of agency uh, under uh, investigation are played out. So the first goal in uh, developing those uh, uh, such narratives uh, consists in bridging a twofold gap. On the one hand, a gap between the concept of agency as defined through uh, the theoretical background uh, constituted by systems ecology and uh, Luhmann's theory of social systems uh, and uh, the uh, uh, concept of agency as is as deployed in uh, uh, the literature um, on uh, the urban metabolism. On the other hand, uh, um, we aim to bridge the gap between how the concept of agency is deployed in uh, the literature and how the same concept is embedded in urban metabolism models. The second goal is uh, highlighting how concepts such as uh, uh, those of homeostasis, information and development can help illuminate how agency is defined and deployed in urban metabolism studies, both from uh, the, um, the standpoint of uh, theorizing about uh, the urban metabolism as a particular kind of uh, um, complex uh, uh, social ecological system, and from the standpoint of modeling uh, the metabolism of uh, uh, urban uh, of uh, uh, social ecological system or urban uh, social ecological systems. In particular, we are interested in the nexus constituted by uh, the concept of agency, information, and space time, as uh, highlighted both through uh, our work uh, on uh, uh, the Odom School in uh, system ecology and Luhmann's uh, theory of social systems and our work on uh, literature related to modeling in uh, urban metabolism studies or literature more, rela more related to theoretical conceptual questions and issues in uh, urban metabolism studies. So, um, to uh, give you uh, just a brief outline how, um, how agency and information are connected from the standpoint of the Odom School in uh, uh, System Ecology. Um, from this perspective, energy constitutes uh, the material substrate from, uh, in for information flows, both uh, in the form of physical, both as physical information and as uh, uh, semantic information. In particular, information is connected to entropy and order in a non-straightforward way, because on the one hand, as H.T. Uh, uh, Odium insists in uh, his introduction to systems ecology, um, entropy can be uh, measured in a rigorous uh, way by um, using the, uh, sorry, information can be measured in a rigorous way by using uh, the concept of, uh, the, 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 um, the, by, by using the quant quantification and uh, formalization of the concept of entropy um, uh, that uh, uh, was developed within uh, the field of information theory, the famous uh, Shannon uh, definition of entropy. However, uh, as Eugene Odum uh, highlights uh, in uh, uh, Fundamentals of Ecology, the development of ecosystems uh, is characterized by, <coughs> sorry, by a decrease in, by an, expo an export of entropy from the ecosystem to the environment and uh, an accumulation of information, a storage of information within the system, the ecosystem itself. And to understand this connection, basically we can see the development of an ecosystem as the relation between uh, three elements, an external environment, um, complex, uh, far from equilibrium, dissipative structures that emerge within the ecosystem, which are in relation with uh, uh, reservoirs uh, of uh, uh, energy and matter. So, uh, whereas uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, um, sorry, whereas the uh, dissipative, uh, uh, far from equilibrium structure uh, acts uh, uh, serves uh, as a storage uh, of uh, information 
uh, with whose uh, uh, entropy level is relatively higher uh, than uh, the uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. So um, the the, uh, the the environment, uh, uh, the level uh, of entropy that characterizes the external environment is uh, uh, globally lower, uh, globally uh, um, higher than the level of entropy that characterizes the ecosystem. However, within the system, uh, the uh, uh, structure that serves uh, as uh, um, uh, storage of information uh, have a level of entropy that is uh, relatively higher than the level of entropy that characterizes the, the reservoir of uh, matters and energy with which uh, they interact. So uh, this uh, differential of entropy is uh, between uh, uh, a structure that serves as a storage for information and a reservoir of energy and matter is precisely what allows uh, uh, the for the concentration of uh, information and uh, a decrease in the overall level of entropy that is the ecosystem, especially through the, uh, the export of uh, uh, energy, low quality energy, uh, for instance, the form of uh, heat towards uh, uh, the environment, the external environment. So the dispersion of uh, energy in the environment. From this standpoint, uh, metabolic processes entail the exchange of information and uh, uh, the ecosystem in the development of ecosystems implies the accumulation and storage of information through the emergence of structures, uh, uh, like for instance, trophic relations in the form of webs. Therefore, from the standpoint of the Odom School, there is a continuum, a uh, uh, natural continuum uh, between uh, uh, the uh, metabolic processes, for instance, uh, uh, cellular metabolic processes, the, um, the, the accumulation, the storage of information and the, tra and the transfer of information uh, through uh, DNA, and the way in which uh, this, uh, the information uh, contained uh, and transferred through the DNA allows for the development of uh, um, uh, beings capable of uh, uh, furthering the information flow, uh, by, for instance, by writing books. So uh, those three steps are connected by information flows that are at the same time uh, energy flows. So and be, uh, here is an example of a narrative based on the characterization of the relation between information and agency uh, they just presented and an example from uh, the literature we analyze. So the city of Paris extracts matter and energy in the form of incoming flows from the suburbs and the broader Ile-de-France region. In this respect, Paris act, acts as a parasitic organism that influences a special temporal uh, situated distribution of resources through natural, socio-economic and institutional processes. The question is how to model that, how to bridge the, the gap from this uh, narrative account, uh, discursive account uh, and the modeling. And this is uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the methodology to which we are tackling this other question is uh, represented by the upper, by the lower section of the diagram I showed in the very first uh, slide. And uh, basically, uh, we are um, trying to uh, connect uh, narratives like the one I just uh, uh, presented to our work, uh, to, to the keywords and key expressions we identified uh, by analyzing the first corpus uh, in uh, uh, sorry, by analyzing the corpus related to the first package in the in, in the project, um, the one constituted by articles uh, uh, dealing with the theoretical and conceptual questions in urban metabolism studies, and on the other hand, uh, connecting uh, those keywords and key expression with the uh, with the keywords. Uh, uh, expressing representing agency agents actors and agency that uh, has an identified in his uh, uh, 
uh, work on model characterization. And the way we are trying to bridge the gap between uh, uh, the two sets of keywords uh, is uh, uh, by using uh, articles from uh, uh, the intersection of the corpus I worked on, uh, the corpus we, we used for the uh, work package one and the corpus uh, that was used for uh, work package two, i.e. the work on models. And uh, for instance, just to give you an example, I'm going to show you a sort of uh, importance table, correspondence table. So, for instance, the term citizens was uh, identified by ESAN as a term uh, uh, referring to uh, agency and a particular kind of, uh, and more precisely, a particular uh, kind of actor, actors in. Uh, um, that are embedded in uh, uh, urban metabolism models, and uh, this uh, this term appeared in a, a, in an article that uh, is belongs to the intersection between uh, the two uh, the two corpora, uh, which is uh, uh, integrating urban metabolism and life cycle assessment. To analyze urban sustain sustainability by Marangi et al. And uh, those, uh, uh, this same article came up in uh, as uh, uh, spe especially relevant document in uh, uh, the analysis of uh, uh, cluster four, network one, cluster two, network two, uh, cluster five, network four in the computational analysis that was presented in the second uh, session of this seminar. And uh, we, oh, sorry, by uh, looking at the uh, characterization of, at the agentic pyramid I, I showed in a, uh, uh, in a previous slide, and the, and, the, and the corresponding uh, outline of a conceptual framework, uh, we connected uh, the, this, the, 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 that keyword from uh, uh, modeling characterization with the salient agentic dimension and salient, salient agents and uh, keywords uh, from uh, the computational analysis on the theoretical literature. In particular, to go back to the example, so citizens, uh, through its association with uh, this article, Morangi et al., uh, the word, uh, the term citizens is connected with those three clusters, and through uh, its connection with three, those three clusters, the term citizens can be um, associated with uh, um, the, sal the salient uh, agentic dimensions uh, constituted by biodiversity as a property of ecosystems, uh, uh, the sustainability of urban systems, the cybernetic agency of a socio-ecological systems components, and uh, the uh, actors uh, or agents corresponding to those uh, uh, same agentic dimensions are humanity as a global ecological force, uh, metabolic system and process, and urban metabolic uh, system. And so we identified the keywords from the uh, from the, from the theoretical literature, quote unquote, that are connected to citizens uh, and which express uh, agentic important agentic dimensions. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, we managed to associate uh, those same keywords with uh, the uh, models uh, connected with the term citizens in uh, uh, essence analysis. Uh, which are um, uh, uh, life cycle analysis and system dynamics, so a combination since the, the, the article in question combines uh, uh, life cycle analysis uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, tools from systems, uh, complex systems analysis, uh, the dynamics of, of complex systems. So to go back to the presentation, so
So uh, now we we have presented a work in progress, and we would like to ask some questions for discussion and feedback. For instance, two questions that might be asked are how to link narratives with keywords from computational analysis, and how to ensure that the link we are drawing between concepts and models through the literature we selected are. Uh, uh, those links are representative of the wider uh, body of knowledge uh, connected with the urban metabolism studies. Uh, do you have further questions uh, that you might ask? Uh, I think these are already part? quite, <laughs> yeah, already quite uh, <laughs> broad. <Sorry>. So, uh, <coughs> based on those questions and questions you might have, uh, we would like to have a uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, with you. And we thank you for thank your attention. Yeah. Should we keep going right in? You want to take a five minute break? Up to you guys. We will. We will. Time's too You call it. You would like a break? Oh, we, we can take a break. Uh, five yeah. minutes break. Yeah. yeah, cool. Five minute break. All right. <coughs>
uh, we'll confirm this. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. Um, cool. So, yeah. It's <laughs> our You're not supposed to ask us questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, as you know, what is what is at stake here is how what we do with, um, you know, how we can use the the conclusions or preliminary conclusions of the uh, work that will be presented along the next few sessions um, about uh, finding the um, cognitive concept relative to agency in the uh, both in the in the uh, urban metabolism corpus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in this kind of um, underground, fundamental underground, conceptual, uh, uh, if you want, uh, 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 how, do you, how, do you, how do we call it, the sous-bois, no, how do we call uh, it? In background. Yeah, ah, background, yeah, like, French, uh, yeah, sous conceptual sous-bois of the, uh, of urban town, which is, uh, uh, you know, Modern systems ecology on the one end and human uh, social system theory on the other hand. These two ends being industrial ecology and social ecology. So how we link this work on this cognitive concept to agency to work with agency in an agency poor conceptual environment so because urban metabolism is conceptually poor in general as a field and, and even less even more poor when we think comes to this concept of agency and um, how to link this work to the actual literature on the operational side mm -hmm. of metabolic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the metabolic field, so the modeling uh, part of it. We really did sound, so the work of Jesse really goes into, okay, or already unpacking things that are already there, and, but working with the keywords that we found on the ground. But we, it's very clear that these, we cannot limit ourselves to those keywords because they, want uh, uh, you know provide the complexity that comes with the concept the term even a, a conceptual uh, field as that brought by the idea of a notion of agency so that's where we we thought these narratives which we also discussed last time could be something that could bridge the two. This is because we use narratives of bridge in many different ways <laughs> in our work. As planners, so often we use narratives of bridges, so this is where it comes from there. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so, um, so the, but first taking these keywords from these bodies and then constructing these narratives and how can these narratives then help us find these things, this idea surrounding uh, expressing agency in this corpus. So that's the. So this is maybe a more general question, but I think it's it's important to help me understand um, um, what you want to do with this. So one thing that I that, that kind of went back and forth here is uh, at times. This seemed like a mostly uh, put it. Well, Stein's gonna think of a broken record. Um, at times this seemed like a descriptive enterprise. He's only gonna talk about that basically just did exactly this, but in a different time, like three weeks ago. Um, at times this seemed like a mostly descriptive enterprise, right? Like what what are they doing? What are they doing when they model, right? What are they modeling and what do they care about? And and what uh, what concepts of agency are floating around there, and how do they? Really, what kind of keywords are in the literature? Uh, but then at times it seems like you you also definitely want to be like intervening in practice, changing practice. You want to be normative with respect to practice, some too, right? So making a decision tree is also about right improving the quality of the work people are doing. Um, you know, I take it that part of what you're trying to do in the end here. Um, in things like this concordance table is to try to say um, here's what the current link with agency looks like 
but then also here's what we think it should look like, mm -hmm. or like here's what you could be doing if you wanted to be doing more of it. You know, if you wanted to be increasing the theoretical foundation. So I wonder, maybe I, this is a tough and very big and very broad question, but like, how explicit are those normative goals and how do you see the kind of, the kind of classificatory stuff interacting with the, with the, the normative intervention stuff? It's a hard question, I know. Because it's 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 um, it's basically the way the project unfolded. So it, in the beginning, it was very implicit simply because we were we were not sure we didn't find um, um, that few on agency. But at the same time, we were we didn't know we had there was so much interest in this concept. So at the beginning, there was no normative approach at all, but only descriptive. We need to trace this uh, the CWR, the concept of the concentration of metabolism. I had some kind of inch that uh, you know it was okay. It was it's not going to be uh, a, a chapter that has been already written on that concept, but it's something. It was a little bit less than my expectation, but I didn't think that I, potentially a normative approach could be proposed because I didn't think that there was so much interest around the concept. So the, the normative show became relevant as we were working on the project already and talking to people even very lately. It was, we had our seminar in, uh, in France uh, a couple of months ago and it was clear we had a special session on that uh, conference. There and it was clear there many people were like, but this is something we are talking about every day. So thanks very much to telling these things and working on this concept. Uh, but we tell we use it in a different way, we, or we, we name things in a different way. Mm -hmm. So the normative approach actually came in during the project as being a potential uh, way to further extend the model uh, decision system because the model decision system in the beginning was thought. We map was is already there, and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's not much things happening around specifically this concept, but there is a lot of questions to a lot of interest to see how things can be, you know, modeling can be better done to if this content where to take a more central role in the field. So yeah, so that's the, how the normative aspect came in uh, in our project, but based based on the feedback we received along the way. Um, but how to do it? <laughs> how to? It's what we actually keep busy discussing. How to kind of uh, uh, you know kind of this is the state of the art. I mean, there's not enough. What should be more? That's that's what it's actually the sense of the first question, you know. Um, yeah. For example, have you ever came across anything any similar project in which narratives are used to pull out implicit concepts that are very relevant when made explicit in a field? It's a bit of this, I mean, this is a bit related to how you design a vignette study, right? I mean, in that sense. I suppose so, yeah, but... You know, if, one, if, if you're trying to do a survey by, by, by presenting people with sort of narrative vignettes and seeing what their reaction to those would be, oftentimes what you're trying to do when you do that, right, is mm. sort of figure out what implicit concepts they're using when they're confronted with a narrative that only implicitly involves mm -hmm. some concept of interest. I guess this is different though, because here, here I think you're trying to make very explicit, explicit in the narratives yeah, the, the narrative. way that agency comes in. Yes, indeed. But the if I may, uh, I think one issue is also because keywords from computational analysis are keywords that already exist in the text, in the, in the corpus, in the, the literature uh, Nicola has uh, analyzed, while narratives are ourselves that are 
kind of building those narratives, yeah. of course, based on this methodology that they, Nicole explained, and based on also the results of the computational analysis, so it's kind of hybrid. Right. But it, they are not extracted uh, as right. such right. from text, they are um, created somehow. So, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Um. Yeah, and there's also, um, mm, let's say, need uh, from the field to come up with uh, ways of uh, uh, combining different kinds of models uh, uh, to uh, address a multifaceted, uh, multi-pronged uh, uh, object of study as uh, the, the metabolism of urban uh, systems and one of the challenges uh, that we are facing in our project is uh, how to use uh, uh, conceptual analysis uh, to uh, uh, let's say um, to highlight and uh, untap the potentials in uh, how models existing models uh, can be combined uh, to uh, um, to come up with uh, more uh, uh, holistic accounts uh, um, of, uh, of of the systems uh, that they, are, they were designed to, of the systems and the dynamics they were designed to study. I mean, that relates a bit. I was actually going to ask that question too. I mean, because one thing that's interesting, so seeing the, the first work on the decision tree, um, it also, I mean, it strikes me that. If I were a researcher in that field, it would also be interesting to me what connections don't exist, mm -hmm. right? Because because that's also you know if you're seeing that these you know whatever a model of, of type X has only ever been used to talk about these kinds of agents. Mm -hmm. Well, is that a, is that a, some kind of a structural or inherent limitation of the model, or is it just happened to be the case that that's the only thing that anyone has ever stuck it onto? Would there be exactly. something? Who is there? Is there a gap in the literature there? Um, that's kind of that's a that's a neat it's a it's a simultaneously yeah yeah uh, uh, as a as an overview of the state of the art you can give you a handle for how to think about what's missing. That's exactly what we're discussing recently with guys on the, the the missing links are more interesting than the links <laughs> and not even maybe more numerical more than the links. Sure. So, uh, as many notes this, is exactly, are. Yeah. Exactly, this, this is exactly why the normative approach became almost necessary because uh -huh. you know the existing links are, are there, but the potential the existing link, but potential links are even more than the existing links. Uh, of course, we won't be able to tackle all of them, but we will represent, we will map all of them, but we will not explain all of them. But at the moment, it looks like there are some. A few missing is, but are there because there is a, a mathematical limitation to the model right. that doesn't allow to or work with those agents, or is this just because, you know, but banally funding was missing, no one ever idea to apply <laughs> right. to extend right. uh, the model into that sense. So we were, of course, we weren't able to explain the reasons for those missing links for all of them, but we will try to. Maybe there's uh, some categories of missing links mm. that can be there. Um, yeah. So, uh, but indeed, the missing links are surely more, more and more, and more, even more interesting than some of the existing ones. Yeah. That's representative this question. is just so difficult. Uh, Whenever you have an analysis like this, you know, trying to trying to be confident that you haven't missed something mm -hmm. um, is nightmarish. And I mean, in some sense, I guess probably the answer to the second question, the answer the answer to the second question is probably that there is no answer to the second question, right? That is to say that at some point you just have to kind of say. Um, Here's an analysis, you know, the, 
the construction of the corpus is made very clear and very straightforward and very evident. If you don't like it, you know, if you can, if you can think of an obvious way that it could be improved, we'd love to hear it. But you know, I mean, because at some point you just have to kind of say, like, like, look, I can defend every choice we made. Um, I, I often, I often give this rant to to, to to people when I'm when I'm doing digital humanities work. Like, I sort of feel like at some point you just have to say, whatever. I could reply to reviewer two to defend every methodological choice I made. You know, are there others? Yes. You know, like, right. sure. You know, are there things that, you know, might have been missed? Sure. Mm. Um, but that's really tough. And I mean, it's, it's, it's such a perennial question. Actually, could you pull back up the concordance table? Because that's, I'm going to stare at that a little bit more. Oh, okay, yeah, that's nice, actually, yeah, so I can see the, the headers, too. And since models are going to appear more than once, and keywords may appear more than once, I mean, you're going to have to do some kind of interesting, funky correlational analysis, too, right? Um, yeah. to try to find which keyword model links are actually significant. You mean correlation on speed? What, what? Between those, like between the WP1 keywords and the models, right, to mm -hmm. build a bridge, because you're going to have, you know, there's going to be a massive bucket. Since, since they all appear, they, they can appear more than once. Mm -hmm. um, some of them may appear a lot. Like I imagine that, well, just for example, I imagine that whatever, like metabolic systems down there, like that will wind up not being very significant because it may kind of be everywhere. Um, it should be interesting to see how to, How to figure out which keywords are really distinctive of the models, right? That's what I'm, that's what I mean. Because um, what you'd almost like is, yeah. If you'd like to know if there's some kind of a special link, right? Not just a link, but an unusual link, yeah. a, a, a particularly significant link mm. between mm. whatever the last three columns or the, the mm. whatever the middle three columns in the model, right? Mm. And I would really like to have your take on the, the distinction or non-distinction between model and the literature of the model, because I was expecting you guys to jump mm. on that, <laughs> mm. but you didn't, were you just <laughs> skipping them? Yeah. As well? Because we are, this is something we discussed with us and a lot, we are taking the paper on the model as a proxy of the model, because that's a way we find more but it's a question of reproducibility. So if someone else can do the same. Uh, we could have, you know, say, okay, we zoom in on material for analysis for a cycle assessment because we can get to maybe the very, the, you know, the, the, the programming of those uh, contact, you know, the, the developers, and, and we we'll just work on the programming on the codes. But then maybe it would pose a problem from for a perspective, you know, but, you know, can be reproduced somewhat. So we use the paper, yeah. which is a, a important epistemological shift, of course, because the paper is not the, the model. How do you? I mean, you didn't seem to react to that. <laughs> is it because you? Okay, it, the, the paper is the the medium that uh, 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 disseminate the model, so it's fine. Without the paper, the model doesn't exist, or yeah, it does exist, so why guys you did it? There is, I mean, there is, of course, there is a, there is a, there is a, a pretty robust philosophy of science literature on model transfer, right, about what does it mean to take a model from one domain and use it in a different domain. Um, but this, yeah, this gets you right to all these thorny questions about like individuation criteria for models, right? So, so I mean, I guess how to put it? 
it didn't parse as too weird to me just because I was like, ah, well, it's just it's a very so it's just a very pragmatic set of individuation criteria for models. That is to say, I feel like the, you know the implicit the implicit uh, position that's in, that's invoked here is uh, you don't really know what the model is unless you know what you do with it, right? And that's what the papers are, the papers are showing you what you do with the model, right? How is it being applied? What is it being applied to? What's it actually doing? Um, and I mean. For me, I'm pretty okay with that. I mean, especially, you know, if, if, since we're dealing with really, well, some of these are extremely abstract models. Now, they're not like the most, you know, it's not like whatever, Locker Volterra models can be applied to like literally anything on Earth, right, if you're creating them. <laughs> like it's, it's like, you know, uh, so it's, maybe it's not quite that abstract. But. Some of them are more, uh, you, you know, do we call them all models, but some of them are more, Model, from families of models, mm -hmm. other are more development of some part of some family of the models. So system dynamics is a development of some part of the models. MFA is a family of models. So we, we for you know for kind of practical reasons we are naming them all models here. Um, but yeah, I mean there are some differences. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, but how could it, uh, could it be? You said there is a literature on uh, transfer of models, okay, but does the literature also goes on what to consider when you when you uh, analyze a model itself? So is it the code? Is it the, mm. how much the application, as you made, as you said, is the model? And how much is the model is only in only the coding? I haven't read that model template transfer stuff in a long time. Yeah. Um, very often, that my recollection of this is hazy, and so I'm very scared to say it in a way that will be recorded and put on the internet. But um, my recollection is that very often, to find examples of models that will have been transferred a lot. Mm. They go to they look at very general models, and so they tend to look at things like you know uh, where a model is where a model in this case is just like a, a, a kind of a, a differential equation representation or something, right? Mm -hmm. So then that those that that collection of differential equations can then be instantiated in the whatever uh, dynamics of all kinds of different systems. So it goes hyper general, so the models become very abstract, and they usually just look at like things like scientific formulas. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, I mean, like I've seen this. I know there's a paper in this exactly this sense where what they did to analyze model transfer was to look at citations of the paper that introduced the model for the first time, right? Because it, it was one of these cases where it was a super general model that was introduced in some kind of a I forget, you know, mathematical biology. Or something, right? But then, like that mathematical biology paper is cited in the management literature, and it's cited in economics, and it's cited in you know that kind of thing. So they could, you know, that I don't think you're, I don't think you're doing something that like people that you know, I don't think people are going to think you're doing something crazy if you're saying that you know papers are the handle, right? Papers are a handle anyway to get to get to the model, especially like I say, especially in cases like this where where if how to put it. If every single paper that used the models was using them in exactly the same way, then it might be like, well, why are you using the papers, right? Just go read the code. Um, but that doesn't seem to be true here, right? The models are being used and applied to pretty radically, sometimes sometimes quite different kinds of cases in different domains to different actors for different purposes. So I think you need the papers, right? I mean, that strikes me as being... Abstracting seems like it would be the wrong choice Mm. in that kind of a context. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I think there is something there too, because this is, this is a, this, I mean, for the, the, the conceptual implication, the philosophical implication of, look, I mean, of looking in, for agency in, in, in models that are world viewing and world making, using a discourse on those world viewing or making, um, I think should be, yeah, should at least state as something that's a methodological uh, 
some point we take because it can change radically if we had if we were to use only the uh, you know the, 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 for example technical specs of modern descriptions sure. you know as our you know like literature sure yeah we we would have some discourse there too huh? because no no it's also part of language so, um, so I'm not going to say this would be, you know, surely only purely the models, of course. It's also a description, there's also a discourse there. But the paper is even more discursive. So taking the discourse on the discourse <laughs> is something, I think, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. If you are looking for, I mean, and then we had some case, you remember, as in which we, we, ah, there is a lot of things on agency here, and then we were, ah, it's actually the guy that's the author is saying, in the next 20 years we have to look into this, and there's nothing to do with uh, just the guy dreaming of right. next. Uh, so this is, but this is very easy, of course, and then right. we excluded those papers. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. I think there is something there that should be at least made very explicit, that we work with the discourse on the models, self-representation sometimes, I don't know. Um, yeah, so, you know, these are agents as well. But at least at least after your filtering, right? Yeah. I mean, the biggest, how to put it, the biggest worry that I would have would be exactly, exactly the kind of thing that you mentioned, right? That is to say that, that in a corpus like this, you've got to be careful because, you know, not, not every author has the same reason to write a journal paper, yeah. right? Um, but it does seem like in this case you've the, the, like precisely the point of that filtering is you're trying to get down to just look these are papers that are sort of first order applications of the models to case studies trying to understand what's going on in a, you know in a context with an example mm. it's they're, they're they're doing the modeling man that's what these papers are yeah. and so that's if you've kind of if you've kind of cut that layer cleanly enough then then at least you you don't you probably don't have the worry of like you know, radically different kinds of thing in your corpus, which you would if you were doing something super broad. Uh, like you say, yeah, all it takes is one editorial to, or whatever, a book review sneaks yeah. in, right? And it, you know, because all of a sudden, um, or even for that matter, in this context, I mean, that I could imagine uh, would, would, would get you to in this, this in, if, not on the on the other end where you use textbooks, for example. But if on this end you had something like a a, a textbook or a review article, that would be also quite different, right? Because that's not that's not doing the work; it's telling you about doing the work, and so that's it has different goals. It'll have different. But like I say, I think you've you took just decided to take care of that problem manually, <laughs> so that problem is gone because you put in the work and fixed it. Um, It's probably very naive, but why? I mean, I assume these models have names to some extent to refer to them. So why not just uh, like check for the name uh, or the naming combination with the reference or something? We check it. You mean to find the articles? Yeah, to, to find the model because, as I understand it, the problem is to uh, to recognize when a specific model is being used uh, and to, to know this, as I understood it, but maybe I'm not uh, you use just the paper on which in which this was introduced, this model, or not. Yeah, the paper yeah. in which, yeah, the speech so, so, but this might be, to some extent, problematic in the sense that they might refer to that paper for other reasons, or, uh, I don't know, we need to have the, not that it's fundamentally problematic, but this might be a worry. If you can combine it with a specific name for the model, then filter out those things. That, I mean, I don't know. I don't know which kind of papers these are, but uh, we it's we screen them with only with only those using only those papers that were uh, actually explaining uh, discussing an application of the model. So really, the model was in the methodology, basically, of the paper. Mm -hmm. If the model was in the intro only or in the conclusion, whatever, even in the discussion. Uh, 
they checked we really, Yeah, them. that we checked oh, man on his skin, all of them to see, and they were all of them. And it was, it's not, we started with the Python code, but then that we man on his scan to protect all of those that were in the methodology and use as methods of the paper. Yeah. But see, there is a, it's a discourse on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, of course. So, uh, yeah. But at the same point, for the, you know, our colleagues that use this paper, uh, this is models, um, this is the way they work. So it's more a nexus paper model than only a model that they have analyzed. But this is the nexus that they work with. Because very rarely you only work with a model and then, okay, where do you publish? Okay, you can do a book, you can do. So this paper, this paper model nexus is what is functional to what circulates the model, basically, mm -hmm. the result of the model. So mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was also wondering, like, the, the proposal, which you don't seem to uh, uh, um, like for good reasons, is, is to look at the, the computer codes, right? Programming codes. Uh, but, but like, it's kind of evident that you could implement the same algorithm or the same model in a thousand different ways, an in infinity of different ways, even. Uh, so, and I guess if it's about similarity, things could be very similar in programming language, although they give very different, they, they use very different mathematical functions inside. Um, so, so I don't see how this would even be possible to to use computer codes. It's it's a diff it's a very difficult problem in, in philosophy of uh, computer science and so on, uh, and philosophy of information and so on to to, to individuate and eat, uh, simple algorithms only. Uh, like we we can intuitively quite easily say that that, that this is two implementations of the same algorithm. Mm -hmm. By uh, by just looking at the computer code and interpreting it, but this is almost impossible to have a theory about it. Weirdly enough, um, it's uh, yeah. There is no you cannot just like compare inputs with outputs. Yeah. You know that that would be a way to do it, but you might come to a very a very different way to the same output. So that cannot be uh, a way to to to. to individuate uh, uh, algorithms. I mean, this is just in general for algorithms. But specifically models, the situation seems to be even more hard. Uh, yeah. So my question would be, why even consider computer codes as something that could uh, as give text. us a, a, a link to models or, or a way to recognize models? Don't all these authors have different codes slightly even? I mean, I don't know. That was actually an initial idea, but then we used the, well, jumped onto using the paper as proxy because um, after the first scan of the literature, which, we, which showed really that the word agency were rarely used, and if we were out to use only the computer coding, we would have basically what one family of model, A to ABM, which use mm -hmm. agents as being really part. And you know, ABM is a family of models, there are many different models down there. It could have been nice as well. But this would have been like a pointing to one family of models again, which is honestly very, uh, still very minor, minor of use. And my idea behind this project was really say this is a concept that is implicit in many other uh, uh, yeah. family of, families of models out there. So we could have done that working on it only with one family model. We could have yeah, been yeah, a bit using the scope, the ambition of the project, but yeah. Maybe that's a follow up <laughs> to just work on that now that we have this broader view. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been. I mean, ABMs are extra weird because it would become, I mean, deciding how to put it. Since so often the behavior of ABMs is emergent anyway, trying to figure out when two ABMs are actually going to actually sort of feel like the same model is a total mess, right? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, that would have been 
messy. But like you say, it's, like it's, not, you know, it's not the only the only way to have agents in your model is to explicitly have agents in your model. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but is this this is an idea that makes it, it's a bit difficult to digest for our colleagues because they see agents and it's for them is uh, alien. <laughs> so, oh sure. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's um, so saying that agency is elsewhere than in ADM, That's a little bit the kind of philosophy of the project, but. Um, it's uh, it's 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 not very easy to digest, um, especially when we deliberately decide to focus on cities because that's the other elephant in the room in this project. Because most of these models have been applied to agents, but not at city level, uh, at like uh, uh, sector levels or uh, value chains level or even uh, national levels or. But city levels, it's hmm, it's tricky because what is a city and the urban system and blah blah. So that's the other level of complexity we kind of set out. Okay, we do this. Okay, but many call we had recently some feedbacks, and it was clearly from people that didn't really took the took the bit urban out of the metabolism. But we we work with urban metabolism, which is again another. So that's another thing. So it means to speak about agency in cities. Which is not always, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's an interesting problem. If you go to a, a conference of people working on these models and you say the word agent, there's just no <laughs> other point of reference for them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It's yeah, totally yeah. reasonable, right? It's like, yeah, we know. Yeah, we use them all the time. It's great. Uh, but yeah, yeah. We all know that logo. Yeah, like, no, it's not the only thing we need. So those narratives are typically mm. a way that we could explain to the thing agency is agent, agent and so ABM, how, what agency could be other than that. Um, that's the kind of uh, translational thing. But um, yeah. Um, does this bring them away from that? No, I just want to add something about about narratives uh, because at the end, uh, the model decision tree uh, will also uh, include uh, some narratives to explain, you know, the user uh, what we mean by actor or stakeholder or whatever keywords we are going to choose, and then. One of the issues we discussed is um, how those narratives in, 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 in the model decision tree uh, could be um, precise and scientifically uh, reliable and understandable for any user and how to connect them to the keywords. So the, the, quest, the first question, how to connect them to the keywords, is also because at the end, in the model decision tree, we will have keywords and narratives, and of course, the user um, mm. won't know particularly the link. But right. in a sci-fi, from a scientific perspective, um, we need to be yeah. sharp in, uh, or, or, or at least uh, uh, precise in connecting. Um, yeah. And that's a challenge too, because you don't want to tell them like. Here's our decision tree. To start using it, please read the following 6,000 words. No, exactly. Uh -huh. exactly. exactly. <laughs> like, whichever of these narratives sounds right to you, click the button and exactly. you're like, well, no, that's, they're never going to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, but for a, for a um, user, um, non-scientific, let's say, or non-researcher yeah. or whatever, um, actor and stakeholder could be Synonyms, while right. uh, in in our analysis they are not synonyms, they are not, not always used as synonyms, and and so it, yeah. how to how to get to this model season three in in mm -hmm. specific and precise without losing the specificity of our research, yeah. um, even though the user won't get, but at least we know that yeah. we, we 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 got the. Yeah, trying to make a tool that will actually be useful, but that doesn't feel like you're just like 
for this way, that doesn't feel like you you could have you could have put it together on day one of the project without all the stuff that you've learned and then you know in the last few years of hard work, right? Um, I've been on projects where we've had this worry before too, right? This is a general, you know, anytime you want to build something that's that's widely useful, that's going to export outside your project, you have to figure out how to not, you know, betray your own. Mm -hmm knowledge of the complexity, right? You know you know how complicated this all is now. Yeah. Um, you think that we can apply ourselves first. <laughs> I wonder that you just we are the main final <laughs> user basically. <laughs> I'm, I'm super keen on using it myself, which is already something. But yeah. That's a that's an old computer science that's a it's an old computer science quip, right? You have to eat your own dog food. This is a good this is a good <laughs> good thing. If you make it, you better like it. <laughs> yeah. If I like it, that would be a really good result. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, in the tool, there is option for users that they can just choose the bottom of the terms, you know, not, not to always go for narr narrations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. If they want, they can double check. Okay, what does it mean with actor exactly here in these two? Sure. But if they don't, maybe we should write something. It's your responsibility. <laughs> 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 if you click, yeah, it's like yeah, the conditions. You, yeah. <laughs> you get the wrong <laughs> results. It's your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read a great paper once that was talking about how. Uh, How powerful the default settings in a si in a piece of scientific software are, right? Like you never know, you know. You you don't think about how much how much control you're exerting if your software suddenly becomes very powerful. Most people are not going to read the help, and they're not going to click any of the buttons. They're just going to hit go. So like you better think really hard about your default your default parameters. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't looked it. Look at look. Oh, I haven't looked at it in a while, in a long while. But I was thinking about the literature on models as fictions. I teach that. Um, if nothing else, it would give you a. It is. I mean, it is certainly a much more. It could be a bridge between between. Thinking about novels and thinking about discourses, yeah, yeah, uh, Roman Freud stuff. Maybe in terms of uh, limitation and constraints. Uh, yeah, what are the boundaries between uh, uh, discursive account and the model? One thing that that is it's commonly underlined in that literature that might be relevant here, right, is this idea that part of what you get when you get a narrative is a kind of set of implicit rules. Yeah. Um, I just corrected the exam question for my students. <laughs> this, is this is like in my head right now. You um, sort of get a set of implicit rules, right, and they're not written down anywhere. And it's actually kind of an interesting question about like how do we get these, like where do these come from? Like you, I've, nobody ever had to tell you that you know, uh, Bilbo Baggins doesn't have an iPhone in The Hobbit, right? You just knew that. Because, like, it doesn't work with the rules. Somehow, like, that, that can't exist in that world. You just know that, right? Um, Sherlock Holmes has a pancreas. Like, that's not written down anywhere. But, like, you're pretty sure he's just a guy. Um, so, yeah, like, that's a really, and I mean, this is kind of an interesting, like, if people are sort of reasoning in Um, and I don't 
I don't know what people's like detailed theories about like how those arise and how you're supposed to analyze them are because I've never gotten really deep into that literature. I mostly present it to students just because it's a really cool, it's like, it's a fun way. If I'm only going to talk about models for an hour, I know they're going to listen if I talk about Bobo Baggins as a wife. Um, <laughs> so like, I teach it, it's good for teaching. Um, but I've never gotten super deep into it. But that. That thing about implicit norms is always really is always really stuck with me. Because I think this is where really we discussed last time. Implicit norms that you were also mentioning, yeah. That's right. I wasn't here for the last. I wasn't here for the last. No, we were in Brussels. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there was something that you felt that indeed could be used to. But at the beginning, you thought that by narratives we we kind of uh, uh, meant. Um, more a discourse that, um, normative discourse, so in, things should be mm. there going in this particular direction. Whereas for us, we, it's, a, it's a discursive, com uh, do you call it predicament? No, discursive... Um, um, account. Account, sorry. Uh, so a way of, a piece of discourse, let's say, on something, so... Yeah, I think, yeah. I think a nice thing about that literature is that it underlines that even in that kind of context, you're still getting something kind of normative mm. that shows up, right? Because there are like rules of the game mm. that you're kind of learning maybe sort of by osmosis, but you're getting them out of narratives when you read narratives. Um, mm. At least heuristic. Uh, yeah, yeah, vague. And that doesn't seem to be so opposed against just See man has discourse. Mm -hmm. And that's a very sort of empty superficial way of looking at it as a discourse, right? Because you're just looking at it as a as a text or something and not at the context at the content, sorry, of the text. See what I mean? Uh, if you have if you can uh, if you can extract some heuristic rules and so on from that, it's like like about uh, whether this or that guy had a smartphone, probably not, or pancreas or something. Uh, but but for, for, for scientific models, this can be very similar things uh, that you kind of know intuitively how to work with it or to derive things that are not explicitly said from the fact that it's supposed to be an analogy of a thing that you know very well. Um, and so all these implicit information that is in it, mm. um, I mean, therefore you have to look at the content uh, and, and not just the words. See the distinction I want to make? Uh, yes, of course. It's a level of abstraction that, that might be necessary or at least useful. The pragmatic term that you just gave it made me think of uh, like the right understanding as well. There's something yeah, about yeah, being able to do true. stuff with the narrative that matters here, right? It's, it's not just it's not just supposed to teach you stuff. It's supposed to teach you how to do stuff. Yeah, you're supposed to be able to use these concepts when you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and that relates. There's there's that's one of the one of the current big hot going theories of scientific understanding as opposed to explanation is that understanding is about like it's not just about knowing the stuff but it's about like, being able to apply the stuff to do stuff with the stuff no. uh, that seems very yeah. seems very reasonable it's got a yeah. lot of agreement in the, in the phil science community right um, but that's related here right that i think that, that's actually another way that, that, that narrative could distinguish itself that, that it, it could also be about Kind of, you know, I can learn a lot about I can learn a lot about the about the state of the field by reading the network. You know, the the keywords in the network. Mm. I arguably can't learn about it. I arguably don't understand the field in direct sense, right? Because I can't do anything with. That. I don't know how to do anything with that knowledge that I get. I have knowledge, but it's not like practically applicable. Whereas maybe you could think about narratives as helping you play that role as well. It's like how you you don't just you don't just learn that whatever uh, and eco, there's an eco, there is an ecological network. You know, no, you learn like this is what you can do with an ecological network with that kind of analysis and that that kind of a model in that kind of context, and then it's about action. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, great.
In this case, what we learn with our uh, the stuff we learn with our narrative are um, learn how to find agency elsewhere than when you, when you, where you think the agency was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, yeah, those narratives should help should should be able for the people to use them to learn because I don't like the word teach, so I try to escape the word teach. They will enable people to learn to um, see agency elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So they are operational in that sense. Yeah, you know? using using the concept of agency. Yeah. In some sense. Mm -hmm. And then next step, so it's a double learning thing. It's a learning cascade. Once you learn to recognize an uh, agency where agency you don't expect to see agencies like elsewhere in an agency based model, then learn how to, uh, that's the normative bit, how even where in models that are not made tailored to track agents to you, to see those models, to say, to see uh, where agency is, or to ask yourself mm -hmm. when I work with material flowers, it's okay, it's comes. In, in time, mm -hmm. where's the agency there? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, tons and times you can see where the agency is because there are sectors in which the MFA tells you about different sectors because you distinguish between, for example, the fossil fuels, the minerals that go into different sectors. Those sectors, you know, deploy agencies because not. Uh, not everyone else can act upon those sectors. So, so the narrative is typically kind of empowering mm -hmm. people to, uh, to see, OK, agency is actually what is, uh, allows me to see uh, the threads mm -hmm. <laughs> beyond the flows. And uh, okay, the thread beyond the flows can be seen in this way. So this sort of uh, uh, learning cascade that the narrative can generate. Yeah. Cool. I maybe have another very naive and general question. So if you're interested in agency, um, how literal does this have to be? In do, does, do you have to word and use the word agent? Uh, or is any kind of... Um, normal human acts that you apply to abstract things or more, more uh, larger things that normally you wouldn't uh, apply that verb to, would it also be directly agent if, you see, uh, when, so if I'm, um, if, uh, well, whatever word that usually uh, human agents, uh, uh, mm. verb that human agents use to describe they are acting. Um, it seems to me that as soon as you're going to apply this to a non-human uh, entity, mm. uh, like a city or uh, you know, uh, the traffic in this, I don't know, mm. whatever, uh, it seems like a form of uh, theoretical agency that is implicit. Um, mm -hmm. For example, if you say, this is a kind of very simplistic uh, uh, example, but if you say of a car, it wants to go to the left, mm -hmm. um, then you're implicitly being agentive about cars, mm -hmm. which makes no sense from a literal point of view, but might, maybe it might be useful to describe the, 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 the traffic situation without having to deal with the people that are inside those cars. Uh, because you don't care about whether there's four of them in there, or, mm. or three, or, or, or whether it's a woman or a man. You just want to go and see where the car wants to go, um, because of the indication and so on. Uh, of course, this has nothing to do with, with, with architecture or, or city planning or something, but uh, it seems to me, intuitively, that you already have a model of agency as soon as you ascribe those kind of uh, attitudes and uh, well, acts to uh, actions, to, to, to things that are usually don't have actions at all, mm -hmm. because they are abstractions. Uh, and you can do that very easily without ever using the word agent. Right? Mm -hmm. 
right? If you say that a car wants to go to the left, you have never used the word agent, uh, but you have implicitly described it as an agent. Mm -hmm. That's why agency is as word than in than in audience based model because this way of describing entities as agent is something that can be seen in in, in models that do not describe agents themselves. But the question would be what's the minimal requirement for this to be agent, for example, the car turns right, does it mean that the car is agency or is it below or under the or upon the um, the, the line of agency? Well that it turns right this is ambiguous because yeah. it can mean two things. It can mean that it's it does this because it wants to do it. Yeah. Um, is it intentional or it it just stops or is it the effect? Yeah. Or yeah. it's just like yeah, the yeah. movement, the physical movement. So all these agentive words are typically ambiguous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless you use things like want or uh, uh, knows that or yeah. in very intentional words, then you're sure that it's going to be an, an agent an analogy yeah. uh, in there somewhere. But indeed, if, it, if it's about uh, moving, uh, uh, going somewhere, Growing, I mean, whatever word you can uh, use that usually describes an, an, uh, an agent, uh, some kind of actions of an agent, yeah. you could also um, see it as uh, merely the physical result of it. Yeah. And then it would not be agentic at all. So, uh, for Bruno Naturi, this is agentic. <laughs> Because as long as it leaves a trace, it's an agency. But that's a, the huge critique that, um, yeah. you know, of course, you see from people that things, you know, no, intentionality has to be there. Um, but you think, if you think of actual and actual theories of Bruno Latour's thinking of agency, you know, the research is observe something, uh, it's an, an action that leaves uh, an observable, unobservable trace. But if, if planets move around their star, mm. that's not, these are not agents, right? They leave for the him, yes, of course. Of course. Of course. Well, for Bruno well, too. But we're not necessarily yes. taking the instant point. I'm not Bruno Latour. But, yeah, it's... Uh, so basically everything is an agent that we can observe. That's the main thing they made. Yeah. That, this that this becomes kind of empty. <laughs> yeah, it is. He made some, he made some exception. Say that because I mean, of course, his interest it was to understand the relationship between the subject and object in, in the science scientific labs. So he was he was trying to decenter the subject and say, okay, it's not the the scientist that make the experiment on the object. The object is constantly experimenting the subject. So that was his main goal. But then he was extrapolated to do many more stuff, and then he. he we, that he didn't care about other stuff. He just cared about those lab environments and how sciences, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. process and beyond the subject and the object the relationships. But uh, but still, he leaves a, a big trace on the agency discussion. But uh, of course, uh, uh, our field is much more informed by ecological, political ecology, uh, and the same way, which is what you mentioned. I mean, the the the, 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 the intentionality must be there, otherwise. Agencies everywhere and nowhere, and also because intentionality re relates to um, is related to uh, responsibility, ethical yeah. responsibility. Yeah. So yeah. now, if you feel funny, now our discipline is something that, of course, uh, who is responsible for whom and for what? Uh, Seems like a good moment to transition to uh, chatting over. So uh, yep. let's thank our speakers again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.